Introduction and Chapter 1 of A Handful of Stars Texts That Have Moved Great Minds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Bauer. A Handful of Stars Texts That Have Moved Great Minds by Frank W. Borum. By way of introduction. It is not good that a book should be alone. This is a companion volume to a bunch of everlastings. O oh God, cried Caliban from the abyss, O oh God, if you wish for our love, fling us a handful of stars. The height evidently accepted the challenge of the depth. Heaven hungered for the love of earth, and so the stars were thrown. I have gathered up a few, and like children with their beads and berries, have threaded them upon this string. It will be seen that they do not all belong to the same constellation. Most of them shed their luster over the stern realities of life. A few glittered in the firmament of fiction. It matters little. A great romance is a portrait of humanity, painted by a master hand. When the novelist employs the majestic words of revelation to transfigure the lives of his characters, he does so because in actual experience he finds those self-same words indelibly engraved upon the souls of men and after all sidney carton's text is really charles dickens text robinson crusoe's text is daniel defoe's text the text that stands embedded in the pathos of uncle tom's cabin is the text that mrs harriet beecher stowe had enthroned within her heart moreover to whatever group these splendid orbs belong their deathless radiance has been derived in every case from the perennial fountain of all beauty and brightness frank w borum armadale melbourne australia chapter one william penn's text the algonquin chiefs are gathered in solemn conclave they make a wild and striking and picturesque group they are assembled under the wide spreading branches of a giant elm not far from the banks of the delaware it is easy to see that something altogether unusual is afoot. Ranging themselves in the form of a crescent, these men of scarred limbs and fierce visage fasten their eyes curiously upon a white man, who, standing against the bowl of the elm, comes to them as white men never came before. He is a young man of about eight and thirty, wearing about his lithe and well-knit figure a sash of sky-blue silk. He is tall, handsome, and of commanding presence. His movements are easy, agile, and athletic. His manner is courtly, graceful, and pleasing. His voice, while deep and firm, is soft and agreeable. His face inspires instant confidence. He has large, lustrous eyes which seem to corroborate and confirm every word that falls from his lips. These tattooed warriors read him through and through, as they have trained themselves to do and they feel that they can trust him. In his hand he holds a roll of parchment, for this young man in the sky-blue sash is William Penn. He is making his famous treaty with the Indians. It is one of the most remarkable instruments ever completed. It is the only treaty, Voltaire declares, that was ever made without an oath, and the only treaty that never was broken. By means of this treaty with the Indians, William Penn is beginning to realize the greatest aspiration of his life. For William Penn has set his heart on being the conqueror of the world. Strangely enough, it was a Quaker who fired the young man's fancy with this proud ambition. Thomas Lew was William Penn's good angel. There seems to be no reason why their paths should cross, yet their paths were always crossing a subtle and inexplicable magnetism drew them together penn's father sir william penn was an admiral owning an estate in ireland when william was but a small boy thomas lew visited cork the coming of the quaker caused a mild sensation nobody knew what to make of it moved largely by curiosity the admiral invited the quaint preacher to visit him he did so and before leaving addressed the assembled household William was too young to understand, but he was startled when, in the midst of the address, a colored servant wept aloud. The boy turned in his astonishment to his father, only to notice that tears were making their way down the bronze cheek of the admiral. The incident filled him with wonder and perplexity. He never forgot it. 
it left upon his mind an indelible impression of the intense realities of all things spiritual as a schoolboy he would wander in the forest that so richly surrounded his essex home and give himself to rapt and silent contemplation on one occasion he tells us he was suddenly surprised with an inward comfort it seemed to him as if a heavenly glory irradiated the room in which he was sitting he felt that he could never afterwards doubt the existence of god nor question the possibility of the soul's access to him it was at oxford that the boy's paths crossed that of the quaker for the second time when as a lad of sixteen william penn went up to the university he found to his surprise that oxford was the home of thomas lou there the good man had already suffered imprisonment for conscience sake the personality of the quaker appealed to the reflective temperament of the young student whilst the good man suffering for his convictions awoke his profoundest sympathies to the horror of his father he ardently espoused the persecuted cause involving himself in such disfavor with the authorities of the university that they peremptorily ordered his dismissal but it was the third crossing of the past that most deeply and permanently affected the destinies of william penn soon after his expulsion from oxford he was appointed victualler of the squadron laying off kinsale and was authorized to reside at and manage his father's irish estate it was whilst he was thus engaged that thomas lou revisited cork penn of course attended the meetings it was in this way he tells us that god in his everlasting kindness guided my feet in the flower of my youth when about two and twenty years of age he visited me with a certain testimony of his eternal word through a quaker named thomas lou the text is that memorable and historic service like a nail in a sure place fastened itself upon the mind of the young officer thomas lou preached from the words this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith the faith that overcomes the faith by which a man may conquer the world the faith that is itself a victory this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith penn was electrified his whole being was stirred to its depths the undying fires of enthusiasm at once blazed up within him one record declares he was exceedingly reached and wept much the quaker chronicle assures us he renounced every hope that he had ever cherished in order that he might realize this one this was in sixteen sixty six the year in which london was devoured by the flames penn's conversion says dr stoughton was now completed that conversion must not be regarded simply as a change of opinion it penetrated his moral nature it made him a new man he rose into another sphere of spiritual life and consciousness in his lecture on evangelists dr alexander white says that the first minister whose words were truly blessed of god for our awakening and conversion has always a place of his own in our hearts thomas lou certainly had a place peculiarly his own in the heart of william penn penn was with him at the last stand true to god cried the dying quaker as he clasped the hand of his most notable convert stand faithful for god there is no other way this is the way in which the holy men of old all walked walk in it and thou shalt prosper live for god and he will be with you i can say no more the love of god overcomes my heart the love that overcomes the faith that overcomes this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith william penn realized his dream he became the conqueror of the world indeed he conquered not one world but two or perhaps after all they are merely two hemispheres of the selfsame world one was the world within the other was the world without and of the two the first is always the harder to conquer the victory that overcometh the world what is the world the puritans talked much about the world and penn was a contemporary of the puritans cromwell died just as the admiral was preparing to send his son to oxford whilst at cork penn sat listening to thomas lowe's sermon on faith that overcometh the world john milton was putting the finishes touches to paradise lost and john bunyan was languishing in bedford jail each of the three had something to say about the world to cromwell it was as he told his daughter 
whatever cooleth thine affection after Christ. Bunyan gave his definition of the world in his picture of Vanity Fair. Milton likened the world to an obscuring mist, a fog that renders dim and indistinct the great realities and vitalities of life. It is an atmosphere that chills the finest delicacies and sensibilities of the soul. It is too subtle and too elusive to be judged by external appearances. In his fine treatment of the world, Bishop Alexander cites, by way of illustration, still another of the contemporaries of William Penn. He paints a pair of companion pictures. He picks a gay scene at the frivolous and dissolute court of Charles II, and beside it he picks a religious assembly of the same period. The first gathering appears to be altogether worldly. The second has nothing of the world about it. Yet, he says, Mary Godolphin lived her life at court without being tainted by a shadow of worldliness, whilst many a man went up to those solemn assemblies with the world raging furiously within his soul. William Penn saw the world in his heart that day as he listened to Thomas Lew. In order that he might overcome it, he embraced the faith that the Quaker proclaimed. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith and by that faith he overcame the world. Many years afterwards he himself told the story. The Lord first appeared to me, he says in his journal, in the twelfth year of my age, and he visited me at intervals afterwards, and gave me divine impressions of himself. He sustained me through the darkness and the debauchery of Oxford, through all my experiences in France, through the trials that arose from my father's harshness, and through the terrors of the great plague. He gave me a deep sense of the vanity of the world, and of the irreligiousness of the religions of it. The glory of the world often overtook me, and I was ever ready to give myself up to it. But invariably, the faith that overcometh the world proved victorious. In his monumental History of the United States, Pancroft says that, splendid as were the triumphs of Penn, his greatest conquest was the conquest of his own soul. Extraordinary was the greatness of his mind, remarkable both for universality and precision, as were the vast conceptions of his genius. Profound as was his scholarship, and astute as was his diplomacy, the historian is convinced that, in the last resort, his greatest contribution to history is the development and influence of his impressive and robust character. He was prepared for his work, Bancroft says by the severe discipline of life and love without dissimulation formed the basis of his being. The sentiment of cheerful humanity was irrepressibly strong in his bosom. Benevolence gushed prodigally from his ever-overflowing heart. And when, in his late old age, his intellect was impaired and his reason prostrated, his sweetness of disposition rose serenely over the clouds of the disease. The winsomeness of his ways and the courtliness of his bearing survived for many months the collapse of his memory and the loss of his powers of speech. Such was his faith's first victory. It was the conquest of the world within. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It was by his faith that he obtained his second great triumph, his conquest of the world without. He disarmed nations by confiding in them. He bound men to himself by trusting them. He vanquished men by believing in them. It was always by his faith that he overcame. When the admiral died, the nation was in his debt to the extent of sixteen thousand pounds. This amount on the recovery Sir William bequeathed to his son. In due time the matter was compounded, William Penn agreeing to accept an immense belt of virgin forest in North America in full settlement of his claim. He resolved to establish a new colony across the seas under happier conditions than any state had ever known. It should be called Pennsylvania. It should be the land of freedom. Its capital should be named Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. He was reminded that his first task would be to subdue the Indians. The savages, everybody said, must be conquered. And William Penn made up his mind to conquer them, but he determined to conquer them in his own way. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The Indians were accustomed to slaughter. They understood no language but the language of the tomahawk and the scalping knife. Ever since the white men had landed on American shores, the forest had resounded with the war-hoops of the tribesmen. 
One night a colonial settlement had been raided by the red men. The next, an Indian village had been burned and its inhabitants massacred by the outraged whites. The Indians looked with hatred upon the smoke of the English settlements. The settlers dreaded the forest which protected the ambush and secured the retreat of their murderous foes. William Penn conquered the Indians, and conquered them, according to his text, by his faith. He will always be mentioned with honor, Macaulay says, as a founder of a colony who did not, in his dealings with the savage people, abuse the strength derived from civilization, and as a lawgiver who, in the age of persecution, made religious liberty the cornerstone of his policy. Immediately upon his arrival he called the Indians to meet him. They gathered under the great elm at Shakamaxon, a spot that is now marked by a monument. He approached the chiefs unarmed, and they, in return, threw away their bows and arrows. Presents were exchanged and speeches made. Penn told the natives that he desired nothing but their friendship. He undertook that neither he nor any of his friends should ever do the slightest injury to a person or the property of an Indian, and they in reply bound themselves to live in love with Onus, as they called him, and with the children of Onus, as long as the sun and moon shall endure. This treaty of peace and friendship was made, as Bancroft says, under the open sky by the side of the Delaware, with the sun and the river and the forest for witnesses. It was not confirmed by an oath. It was not ratified by signatures and seals. No written record of the conference can be found, and its terms and conditions had no abiding monument but on the heart. There they were written like the law of God and were never forgotten. The simple sons of the wilderness, returning to their wigwams, kept the history of the covenant by strings of wampum, and, long afterwards in their cabins, they would count over the shells on a clean piece of bark, and recall to their own memory, and repeat to their children, or to the stranger, the words of William Penn. The world laughed at the fantastic agreement, but the world noticed at the same time that, whilst the neighboring colonies were being drenched in blood and decimated by the barbarity of the Mohicans and the Delawares, the hearts of Pennsylvania enjoyed an undisturbed repose. No drop of Quaker blood was ever shed by an Indian. So complete was the victory of the faith of William Penn. Nor was the conquest merely negative, when, after a few years, the Quakers began to swarm across the Atlantic to people the new settlement, they were confronted by experiences such as await all pioneers in young colonies. There were times of stress and privation and hardship. The stern voice of necessity commanded even delicate women to undertake tasks for which their frames were far too frail. In that emergency, the Indians came to the rescue. The red men worked for them, trapped for them, hunted for them, and served them in a thousand ways. You are all the children of Onus, they said. Nothing delighted the Indians more than to receive the great Onus as their guest. A feast was arranged in the depths of the forest, bucks were killed, cakes were cooked, and the whole tribe abandoned itself to festivity and rejoicing. And when years afterwards they heard that Onus was dead, they sent his widow a characteristic message of sympathy, accompanied by a present of beautiful furs. These skins, they said, are to protect you whilst passing through the thorny wilderness without your guide. The story of the founding of Pennsylvania is, as a classical writer finally says, one of the most beautiful incidents in the history of the age. It was the victory of faith, the faith that overcometh the world. This is the victory the victory that overcometh the world, the world within, the world without. His character always triumphed, says Bancroft. His name was fondly cherished as a household word in the cottages of the old world, and not a tenant of a wigwam from the Susquehanna to the sea doubted his integrity. His fame is as wide as the world. He is one of the few who have gained abiding glory. The Conquest of the World Nobody doubted his integrity. He gained abiding glory. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Of a Handful of Stars Texts that have moved great minds By Frank W. Borum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bower Chapter 2 
Robinson Crusoe's Text During the years that Robinson Crusoe spent upon the island, his most distinguished visitor was a text. Three times it came knocking at the door of his hut and at the door of his heart. It came to him as his doctor in the day of sore sickness. It came as his minister when his soul was in darkness and distress. And it came as his deliverer in the hour of his most extreme peril. Nine months after the shipwreck, Crusoe was overtaken by a violent fever. His situation filled him with alarm, for he had no one to advise him, no one to help him, no one to care whether he lived or died. The prospect of death filled him with ungovernable terror. Suddenly, he says, it occurred to my thought that the Brazilians take no physic but tobacco for all their distempers, and I remembered that I had a roll of tobacco in one of the chests that I had saved from the wreck. I went, directed by heaven, no doubt, for in this chest I found a cure both for soul and body. I opened the chest and found the tobacco that I was looking for, and I also found a Bible which, up to this time, I had found neither leisure nor inclination to look into. I took up the Bible and began to read. Having opened the book casually, the first words that occurred to me were these, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. The words were very apt to my case. They made a great impression upon me, and I mused upon them very often. I left my lamp burning in the cave lest I should want anything in the night, and went to bed. But before I lay down, I did what I had never done in all my life. I kneeled down and prayed. I asked God to fulfill the promise to me that if I called upon Him in the day of trouble, He would deliver me. Those who have been similarly situated know what such prayers are worth. When the devil was sick, the devil a saint would be. Crusoe's prayer was the child of his terror. He was prepared to snatch at anything which might stand between him and a lonely death. When he called for deliverance, he meant deliverance from sickness and solitude. But it was not that deliverance that the text had come to speak. When, therefore, the crisis had passed, the text repeated its visit. It came to him in time of health. Now, says Crusoe, I began to construe the words that I had read, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me, in a different sense from what I had done before. For then I had no notion of any deliverance but my deliverance from the captivity I was in. But now I learned to take it in another sense. Now I looked back upon my past life with such horror, and my sins appeared so dreadful that my soul sought nothing of God but deliverance from the load of guilt that bore down all my comfort. As for my lonely life, it was nothing. I did not so much pray for deliverance from my solitude. It was of no consideration in comparison with deliverance from my sin. This second visit of the text brought him, Crusoe tells us, a great deal of comfort. So did the third. That third memorable visit was paid eleven years later. Everybody remembers the stirring story. It happened one day about noon, Crusoe says. I was exceedingly surprised on going toward my boat to see the print of a man's naked foot on the shore. I stood like one thunderstruck, or as if I had seen a ghost. I examined it again and again to make sure that it was not my fancy, and then, confused with terror, I fled like one pursued to my fortification scarcely feeling the ground I trod on, looking behind me at every two or three steps, and fancying every stump to be a man. It was on his arrival at his fortification that the text came to him the third time. Lying in my bed, he says, filled with thoughts of my danger from the appearance of savages, my mind was greatly discomposed. Then, suddenly, these words of Scripture came into my thoughts. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Upon this, rising cheerfully out of my bed, I was guided and encouraged to pray earnestly to God for deliverance. It is impossible to express the comfort this gave me. In answer, I thankfully laid down the book and was no more sad. These, then, were the three visits that the text made to Caruso on his desolate island. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. When the text came to him the first time, he called for deliverance from sickness, and was in a few days well. 
when the text came to him the second time he called for deliverance from sin and was led to a crucified and exalted savior when the text came to him the third time he called for deliverance from savages and the savages so far from hurting a hair of his head furnished him with his man friday his staunchest truest friend he ever had call upon me said the text not once nor twice but thrice and three times over crusoe called and each time was greatly and wonderfully delivered robinson crusoe was written in seventeen nineteen exactly a century later the monastery was published and significantly enough the text which shines with such luster in daniel defoe's masterpiece forms also the pivot of sir walter scott's weird story mary avenel comes to the climax of her sorrows she seems to have lost everything and everybody her life is desolate her grief inconsolable her faithful attendant tibby exhausts herself in futile attempts to compose and comfort the mind of her young mistress father eustace does his best to console her but she feels that it is all words 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 all at once however she comes upon her mother's bible the bible that had passed through so many strange experiences and had been so wonderfully preserved remembering that this little book was her mother's constant stay and solace her counsellor in time of perplexity and her comfort in the hour of grief mary seized it sir walter says with as much joy as her melancholy situation permitted her to feel ignorant as she was of its contents she had nevertheless learned from infancy to hold the volume with sacred veneration on opening it she found that among the leaves there were texts neatly inscribed with her mother's handwriting in mary's present state of mind these passages reaching her in a time so critical and in manner so touching strangely affected her she read on one of these slips the consoling exhortation call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me there are those sir walter says to whom a sense of religion has come in storm and tempest there are those whom it has summoned amid scenes of revelry and idle vanity and there are those too who have heard its still small voice amid rural leisure and placid contentment but perhaps the knowledge which causes not to err is most frequently impressed upon the mind during seasons of affliction the tears are the softened showers which cause the seed of heaven to spring and take root in the human breast at least it was thus for mary avenel she read the words call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me and her heart acquiesced in the conclusion surely this is the word of god in the case of mary avenel the resultant deliverance was as dramatic as in the case of robinson crusoe i turn a few pages of the monastery and i come upon this the joyful news that halbert glendening mary's lover still lived was quickly communicated through the sorrowing family his mother wept and thanked heaven alternately on mary avenel the impression was inconceivably deeper she had newly learned to pray and it seemed to her that her prayers had been instantly answered she felt that the compassion of heaven which she had learned to implore in the very words of scripture call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me had descended upon her in a manner almost miraculous and recalled the dead from the grave at the sound of her lamentations i lay this written by sir walter scott in eighteen nineteen beside that written by daniel defoe in seventeen nineteen in the mouths of two such witnesses shall every word be established what was it that led daniel defoe and sir walter scott to give the text such prominence what was it in the text that appealed so irresistibly to robinson crusoe and to mary avenel the answer is fourfold one it was the charm of companionship robinson crusoe fancied that he was alone upon his island mary avenel fancied that she was left friendless and forsaken they are both mistaken and it was the text that showed them their mistake call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee if such a deliverer is at hand so near as to be within sound of their voices how can robinson crusoe be solitary or mary avenel forsaken speak to him thou for he hears spirit with spirit can meet closer is he than breathing 
and nearer than hands and feet. If there be a shadow of truth in Robinson Crusoe's text, there is no such thing as loneliness for any of us. 2. It was the ring of certainty. There is a strange and holy dogmatism about the great evangelical promise, Call, and I will deliver. Other physicians say, I will come and do my best. The great physician says, I will come and heal him. The Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. He did not embark upon a magnificent effort. He came to do it. 3. It was the claim of monopoly. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. It suggests the utter absence of alternatives, of selection, of picking and choosing. In the straits of the soul, the issues are wonderfully simple. There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. It is this companion, or solitude, this deliverer, or captivity, this savior, or none. 4. It was the absence of technicality. Call, that is all. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Call, as a little child calls for his mother. Call, as a drowning man calls for help. Call, as a frenzied woman calls wildly for succor. There are great emergencies in which we do not fastidiously choose our words. It is not the mind but the heart that, at such moments, gives to the tongue its noblest eloquence. The prayer that moves omnipotence to pity, and summons all the hosts of heaven to help, is not the prayer of nicely rounded periods, faultily faultless, icily regular, splendidly null, but the prayer of passionate entreaty. It is a call, a call such as a doctor receives at the dead of night, a call such as a fireman receives when all the alarms are clanging, a call such as the ships receive in mid-ocean, when, hurtling through the darkness and the void, there comes the wireless message, S.O.S. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Had the text demanded a tinge of technicality, it would have been useless to Robinson Crusoe. It would have mocked the simple soul of poor Mary Avenel. But call. Robinson Crusoe can call. Mary Avenel can call. Anybody can call. Wherefore, call, says the text, just call and he will deliver. But I need not have resorted to fiction for a testimony to the value and efficacy of the text. Striking and significant as that testimony is, I need have summoned neither Daniel Defoe nor Sir Walter Scott. I could have dispensed with both Robinson Crusoe and Mary Avenel. I could have called a king and queen to bear all the witness that I wanted, King Edward the Seventh, and Queen Alexandra. For Robinson Crusoe's text is King Edward's text, and Mary Avenel's text is Queen Alexandra's text. There are men and women still living who remember those dark and dreadful days of December 1871, when it seemed as if the life of King Edward, then Prince of Wales, hung by a single thread. Nobody thought of anything else. The whole world seemed to surround that royal sickbed. The empire was in a state of breathless suspense. Sunday, the 10th of December, was set aside as a day of solemn intercession, and the strained intensity of the public anxiety reflected itself in crowded but hushed congregations. And what was going on at that inner heart of things? Early that Sunday morning, the princess, afterwards Queen Alexandra, opened her Bible and was greeted with these words, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. A little later, just as the vicar of Sandringham, the Rev. W. L. Onslow, was preparing to enter his pulpit, he received a note from the princess. My husband being, thank God, somewhat better, she wrote, I am coming to church. I must leave, I fear, before the service is concluded, that I may watch by his bedside. Can you not say a few words in prayer in the early part of the service, that I may join you in prayer for my husband before I return to him. The congregation was deeply affected when the princess appeared, and the rector, with trembling voice, said, The prayers of the congregation are earnestly sought for His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, who is now most seriously ill. This was on December the 10th. For the next few days the prince hovered between life and death. The crisis came on the 14th, which, ominously enough, was the anniversary of the death of the prince consort. 
but whilst the superstitious shook their heads the princess clung desperately and believingly to the hope that the text had brought her and that day in a way that was almost dramatic the change came sir william gull the royal physician had done all that the highest human skill could suggest he felt that the issue was now in other hands than his he was taking a short walk up and down the terrace when one of the nurses came running to him with pallid face and startled eyes oh come sir william she said there is a change the prince is worse and as the doctor and nurse hurried together to the sick bed she added bitterly i do not believe that god answers prayer here is all england praying that he may recover and he is going to die but sir william gull's first glance at the royal patient showed him that the change was for the better from that moment there was a sure hope of the prince's recovery and by christmas day he was out of danger later on when her husband's restoration was complete the princess raised a monument to the deliverance that she had experienced she presented to the sandringham church a brass lectern bearing the inscription to the glory of god a thank offering for his mercy fourteen december eighteen seventy one alexandra when i was in trouble i called upon the lord and he heard me nor is that quite the end of the story thirty years later the prince ascended the throne he was to have been crowned on June 26, 1902, but again he was stricken down by serious illness. He recovered, however, and the coronation took place on the 9th of August. Those familiar with the coronation service noticed a striking innovation. The words, When I was in trouble, I called upon the Lord, and He heard me, were introduced into one of the prayers. The words, Archdeacon Wilberforce afterwards explained, were written by the king's own hand, and were used by the archbishop at his majesty's express command call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me says the text when i was in trouble i called upon the lord and he heard me said king edward and queen alexandra i was in trouble through my sickness and in trouble through my sin said robinson crusoe and when i called upon the lord he heard and delivered me so true it is that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord, the same shall be saved. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of A Handful of Stars Texts That Have Moved Great Minds By Frank W. Borum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer Chapter 3 James Chalmers' Text He was a broth of a boy, his biographer tells us. He lived chiefly on boots and boxes. Eager to know what lay beyond the ranges, he wore out more boots than his poor parents found it easy to provide. Taunted by the constant vision of the restless waters, he put out to sea in broken boxes and leaky barrels that he might follow in the wake of the great navigators. He was a born adventurer. Almost as soon as he first opened his eyes and looked around him, he felt that the world was very wide, and vowed that he would find its utmost edges. From his exploration of the hills and glens around his village home, he often returned too exhausted either to eat or sleep. From his ventures upon the ocean, he was more than once brought home on a plank, apparently drowned. The wind and the sea were his playmates, we are told. He was as much at home in the water as on the land, in fishing, sailing, climbing over the rocks and wandering among the silent hills he spent a free careless happy boyhood every day had its own romance its hairbreadth escape its thrilling adventure therein lies the difference between a man and a beast at just about the time that james chalmers was born in scotland captain stewart led his famous expedition into the hot and dusty heart of australia when he reached Cooper's Creek on the return journey, he found that he had more horses than he would be able to feed. So he turned one of them out on the banks of the creek and left it there. When Burke and Wills reached Cooper's Creek twenty years later, the horse was still grazing peacefully on the side of the stream and looked up at the explorers with no more surprise or excitement than it would have shown if but twenty hours had passed since it last saw human faces. It had found air to breathe and water to drink and grass to nibble. What did it care about the world? But with man it is otherwise. He wants to know what is on the other side of the hill. What is on the other side of the water? 
what is on the other side of the world. If he cannot go north, south, east, and west himself, he must at least have his newspaper, and the newspaper brings all the ends of the earth every morning to his doorstep and his breakfast table. This, I say, is the difference between a beast and a man, and James Chalmers, known in New Guinea as the most magnificent specimen of humanity on the islands, was every inch a man. But his text? What was James Chalmers' text? When he was eighteen years of age, Scotland found herself in the throes of a great religious revival. In the sweep of this historic movement, a couple of evangelists from the north of Ireland announce that they will conduct a series of evangelistic meetings at Inverary. But Chalmers and a band of daring young spirits under his leadership feel that this is an innovation which they must strenuously resist. They agree to break up the meetings. A friend, however, with much difficulty persuades Chalmers to attend the first meeting and judge for himself whether or not his project is a worthy one. It was raining hard, he says, in some autobiographical notes found among the treasures after the massacre. It was raining hard, but I started, and on arriving at the bottom of the stairs, I listened whilst they sang, All people that on earth do dwell, to the tune Old Hundred. And I thought I had never heard such singing before, so solemn yet so joyful. I ascended the steps and entered. There was a large congregation, and all intensely in earnest. The younger of evangelists was the first to speak. He announced as his text the words, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He spoke directly to me. I felt it much, but at the close I hurried away back to town. I returned the Bible to the friend who, having persuaded me to go, had lent it to me, but I was too upset to speak much to him. On the following Sunday night he was, he says, pierced through and through, and felt lost beyond all hope of salvation. On the Monday the local minister, the Reverend Gilbert Meekle, who had exercised a deep influence over his early childhood, came to see him and assured him that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, could cleanse him from all sin. This timely visit convinced him that deliverance was at any rate possible. Gradually he came to feel that the voices to which he was listening were, in reality, the voice of God. Then, he says, I believed unto salvation. He felt that the voices to which he was listening were, in reality, the voice of God. That is precisely what the text says. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Bride only says, Come, because the Spirit says, Come. The Church only says, Come, because her Lord says, Come. The Evangelist only said, Come, because the voice divine said, Come. He felt that the voices to which he was listening were, in reality, the voice of God, and he believed unto salvation. The Spirit said, Come. The Bride said, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. I was a thirst, says Chalmers, and I came. And thus a great text began in a great soul, the manufacture of a great history. Forty years later, a thrill of horror electrified the world when the cables flashed from land to land the terrible tidings that James Chalmers, the most picturesque and romantic figure in the religious life of his time, had been killed and eaten by the Fly River cannibals. It is the evening of Easter Sunday. It has for years been the dream of his life to navigate the Fly River and evangelize the villages along its banks. And now he is actually doing it at last. He is away up the Fly River, wrote Robert Louis Stevenson. It is a desperate venture, but he is quite a living stone card. Stevenson thought Chalmers all gold. He is a rowdy, but he is a hero. You can't weary me of that fellow. He is as big as a house and far bigger than any church. He took me fairly by storm for the most attractive, simple, brave, and interesting man in the whole Pacific. I wonder, Stevenson wrote to Mrs. Chalmers. I wonder if even you know what it means to a man like me, a man fairly critical, a man of the world, to meet one who represents the essential and who is so free from the formal, from the grimace. But I digress. As Stevenson says, Chalmers is away up the Fly River, a desperate venture, but he is boisterously happy about it, and at sunset on this Easter Sunday evening they anchor off a populous settlement just around a bend of the river. The natives, coming off in their canoes, swarm onto the vessel. With some difficulty, Mr. Chalmers persuades them to leave the ship. 
promising that he will himself visit them at daybreak. The savages, bent on treachery and slaughter, pull ashore and quickly dispatch runners with messages to all the villages around. When early next morning Mr. Chalmers lands, he is surprised to find a vast assemblage gathered to receive him. He is accompanied by Mr. Tompkins, his young colleague, not long out from England, and by a party of ten native Christians. They are told that a great feast has been prepared in their honor, and they are led to a large native house to partake of it. But as he enters, Mr. Chalmers is felled from behind with a stone club, stabbed with a cassowary dagger, and instantly beheaded. Mr. Tompkins and the native Christians are similarly massacred. The villages around are soon the scenes of horrible cannibal orgies. I cannot believe it, exclaimed Dr. Parker from the pulpit of City Temple, on the day on which the tragic news reached England. I cannot believe it. I do not want to believe it. Such a mystery of providence makes it hard for our strained faith to recover itself. Yet Jesus was murdered. Paul was murdered. Many missionaries have been murdered. When I think of that side of the case, I cannot but feel that our honored and noble-minded friend has joined a great assembly. James Chalmers was one of the truly great missionaries of the world. He was, in all respects, a noble and kingly character. And so it was whispered from lip to lip that James Chalmers, the great heart of New Guinea, was dead, 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 although John Oxenham denied it. Great heart is dead, they say, great heart is dead, they say. Nor dead nor sleeping he lives on, his name shall kindle many a heart to equal flame. The fire he kindled shall burn on and on, till all the darkness of the lands be gone, and all the kingdoms of the earth be one and one. A soul so fiery sweet can never die, but lives and loves and works through all eternity. Yes, lives and loves and works. There will be much to do in heaven, he wrote to an old comrade in one of his last letters ever penned. I guess I shall have a good mission work to do, great, brave work for Christ. He will have to find it, for I can be nothing else than a missionary. And so, perchance, James Chalmers is a missionary still. Now, underlying this brave story of a noble life and a martyr death is a great principle. And it is a principle that if we look, we shall find embedded in the very heart of James Chalmers' text. No law of life is more vital. Let us return to that evangelistic meeting held on that drenching night in Inverary, and let us catch once more those matchless cadences that won the heart of Chalmers. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let him that is a thirst come. I was a thirst, says Chalmers, so I came. Let him that heareth say come. James Chalmers heard. He felt that he must say. That is the connecting link between the evangelistic meeting at Inverary and the triumph and tragedy of New Guinea. Let him that heareth say. That is the principle embedded in the text. The soul's exports must keep pace with the soul's imports. What I have freely received, I must freely give. The boons that have descended to me from a remote ancestry, I must pass on with interest to a remote posterity. The benedictions that my parents breathed on me must be conferred by me upon my children. Let him that heareth say, What comes into the city of Mansoul at Eargate must go out again at Lipgate. The auditor of one day must become the orator of the next. It is a very ancient principle. He that reads, says the prophet, must run. He that sees must spread. With those quick eyes of his, James Chalmers saw this at a glance. He recognized that the kingdom of Christ could be established in no other way. He saw that the gospel could have been offered to him on no other terms. What, therefore, he had with such wonder heard, he began with great delight to proclaim. Almost at once he accepted a Sunday school class, the following year he began preaching in those very villages through which, as a boy, his exploratory wanderings had so often taken him. A year later he became a city missionary, that he might pass on the message of the Spirit and the Bride to the teeming poor of Glasgow. And twelve months later still he entered college, in order to equip himself for service in the uttermost ends of the earth. His boyish passion for books and boxes had been sanctified at last by his consecration to a great heroic mission. 
Let him that is a thirst come. I was a thirst, says Chalmers, and I came. Let him that heareth say, Come. And Chalmers, having heard, said, Come, and said it with effect. Dr. Law speaks of 130 mission stations which he established at New Guinea. And look at this. On the first Sabbath in every month, not less than 3,000 men and women gather devotely round the table of the Lord, reverently commemorating the event which means so much to them and to all the world. Many of them are known to Chalmers as savages in feathers and war paint. Now, clothed in their right mind, the wild, savage look all gone, they form part of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and are members of His church. Many of the pastors who preside at the Lord's table bear on their breasts the tattoo marks that indicate that their spears have been imbrued with human blood. Now sixty-four of them, thanks to Mr. Chalmers' influence, are teachers, preachers, and missionaries. They too, having listened, proclaim, having received, give, having heard, say, having been auditors, have now become orators. They have read, and therefore they run. Having believed with the heart, they therefore confess with the mouth. This is not only a law of life, it is the law of the life everlasting. It is only by loyalty to this golden rule, on part of all who hear the Spirit and the Bride say come, that the kingdoms of this world can become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. It is the secret of world conquests, and beside it there is no other. The Spirit and the Bride say come, and let him that heareth say come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let him that is a thirst come, let him that heareth say come. I have somewhere read that in the solitude of the great dusty desert, when a caravan is in peril of perishing for want of water, they give one camel its head and let him go. The fine instincts of the animal will lead him unerringly to the refreshing spring, as soon as he is but a speck on the horizon, one of the Arabs mounts his camel and sets off in the direction that the liberated animal has taken. When, in turn, he is scarcely distinguishable, another Arab mounts and follows. When the loose camel discovers water, the first Arab turns and waves to the second, the second to the third, and so on, until all the members of the party are gathered at the satisfying spring. As each man sees the beckoning hand, he turns and beckons to the man behind him. He that sees signals. He that hears utters. It is the law of the life everlasting. It is the fundamental principle of James Chalmers' text and of James Chalmers' life. Let him that is a thirst come. I was a thirst, says Chalmers, so I came. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one. Stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus. I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. And now I live in him. The life that James Chalmers lived in his Lord was a life so winsome that he charmed all hearts, a life so contagious that savages became saints beneath his magnetic influence. He had heard at Inverary the spirit and the bride say come, and he esteemed it a privilege beyond all price to be permitted to make the abodes of barbarism and the habitations of cruelty re-echo the matchless music of that mighty monosyllable. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of A Handful of Stars Texts that have moved great minds By Frank W. Borum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer Chapter 4. Sidney Carton's Text Memory is the soul's best minister. Sidney Carton found it so. On the greatest night of his life, the night on which he resolved to lay down his life for his friend, a text swept suddenly into his mind, and from that moment it seemed to be written everywhere. He was in Paris. The French Revolution was at its height. Sixty-three shuddering victims had been borne that very day to the guillotine. Each day's toll was heavier than that of the day before. No man's life was safe. Among the prisoners awaiting death in the concergier was Charles Darnay, the husband of her whom Sidney himself had loved with so much devotion but so little hope. Oh, Miss Manette, he had said on the only occasion on which he had revealed his passion, when, in the days to come, 
You see your own bright beauty springing up anew at your feet. Think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. And now that hour had come. It happened that Charles Darnay and Sidney Carton were, in form and feature, extraordinarily alike. Darnay was doomed to die on the guillotine. Carton was free. For the first time in his wayward life, Sidney saw his course clearly before him. His years had been spent aimlessly, but now he set his face like a flint towards a definite goal. He stepped out into the moonlight, not recklessly or negligently, but with the settled manner of a tired man who had wandered and struggled and got lost, but who at length struck into his road and saw its end. He would find some way of taking Darney's place in the gloomy prison. He would, by his substitution, restore her husband to Lucy's side. He would make his life sublime at its close. His career should resemble a day that, fitful and overcast, ends at length in a glorious sunset. He would save his life by losing it. It was at that great moment that memory exercised its sacred ministry upon the soul of Sidney Carton. As he paced the silent streets, dark with heavy shadows, the moon and the clouds sailing high above him, he suddenly recalled the solemn and beautiful words which he had heard read at his father's grave. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Sidney did not ask himself why the words had rushed upon him at that hour, although, as Dickens says, the reason was not far to seek. But he kept repeating them, and when he stopped, the air seemed full of them. The great words were written across the houses on either side of him. He looked up, and they were inscribed across the dark clouds and the clear sky. The very echoes of his footsteps reiterated them. When the sun rose, it seemed to strike those words. The burden of the night, straight and warm to his heart in its long bright rays. Night and day were both saying the same thing. He heard it everywhere. He saw it everywhere. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whomsoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That was Sidney Carton's text. It is a great thing, a very great thing, to be able to save those you love by dying for them. I well remember sitting in my study at Hobart one evening when there came a ring at the bell. A moment later a man whom I knew intimately was shown in. I had seen him a few weeks earlier, yet as I looked upon him that night I could scarcely believe it was the same man. He seemed twenty years older. His hair was gray, his face furrowed, and his back bent. I was staggered at the change. He sat down and burst into tears. Oh, my boy, my boy, he sobbed. I let him take his time, and, when he had regained his self-possession, he told me of his son's great sin and shame. I have mentioned this to nobody, he said but I could keep it to myself no longer. I knew that you would understand. And then he broke down again. I can see him now as he sits there, rocking himself in his agony and moaning. If only I could have died for him. If only I could have died for him. But he couldn't. That was the torture of it. I remember how his heartbroken cry rang in my ears for days and on the following Sunday there was only one subject on which I could preach. And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went he cried, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It was the unutterable grief of David and of my poor friend that they could not save those they loved by dying for them. It was the joy of Sidney Carton that he could. He contrived to enter the concierge, made his way to Darnay's cell, changed clothes with him, 
hurried him forth, and then resigned himself to his fate. Later on, a fellow prisoner, a little seamstress, approached him. She had known Darnay, and had learned to trust him. She asked if she might ride with him to the scaffold. "'I am afraid,' she said. "'But I am little and weak, and if you will let me ride with you and hold your hand, it will give me courage.' As the patient eyes were lifted to his face, he saw a sudden doubt in them, and then astonishment. She had discovered that he was not Darnay. "'Are you dying for him?' she whispered. "'For him and his wife and child. Hush, yes. Oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, stranger. Hush, yes, my poor sister, to the last. Nobody has ever read a tale of two cities without feeling that this was the moment of Sidney Carton's supreme triumph. It is, he said, and they were the last words in the book. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. He had never tasted a joy to be compared with this. He was able to save those he loved by dying for them. That is precisely the joy of the cross. That was the light that shone upon the Savior's path through all the darkness of the world's first Easter. That is why, when he took the bread and the wine, the emblems of his body about to be broken and his blood about to be shed, he gave thanks. It is that, and that alone, that counts for the facts that he entered the Garden of Gethsemane with a song upon his lips. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising its shame. Death, he said, what of death? I am the life, not only myself, but of all who place their hands in mine. The grave? What of the grave? I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He felt that it was a great thing, a very great thing, to be able to save those he loved by dying for them. I am the resurrection. Those were the words that Sidney Carton saw written on land and on water, on earth and on sky, on the night on which he made up his mind to die. I am the resurrection. They were the words that he had heard read beside his father's grave. They are the words that we echo, in challenge and defiance, over all our graves. The rubric of the Church of England requires its ministers to greet the dead at the entrance to the churchyard with the words, I am the resurrection and the life. And following the same sure instinct, the ministers of all the other churches have adopted a very similar practice. The earth seems to be a garden of graves. We speak of those who have passed from us as the great majority. We appear to be conquered, but it is all an illusion. O oh, grave, we ask, in every burial service, where is thy victory? And the question answers itself. The victory does not exist. The struggle is not yet ended. I am the resurrection. I am the life. That is what all the echoes were saying as Sidney Carton, cherishing a great heroic purpose in his heart, paced the deserted streets that night. I am the life. I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever believeth in me shall never die. That being so, what does death matter? O oh, death, we cry, where is thy sting? And once more the question answers itself. O oh, death, where is thy sting? I am the life. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I am the resurrection. The life and the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. The text that he saw in every sight and heard in every sound made all the difference to Sidney Carton. The end came soon, and this is how Dickens tells the story. The Trumbulls arrive at the guillotine. The little seamstress is ordered to go first. They solemnly bless each other. The thin hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet, bright constancy is in the patient face. She is gone. The knitting women, who count the fallen heads, murmur, Twenty-two! And then, 
I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. They said of him about the city that night, that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. I am the resurrection. O grave, where is thy victory? I am the life. O death, where is thy sting? But there was more in Sidney Carton's experience than we have yet seen. It happens that this great saying about the resurrection and the life is not only Sidney Carton's text, it is Frank Bullen's text. And Frank Bullen's experience may help us to a deeper perception of Sidney Carton's. In his With Christ at Sea, Frank Bullen has a chapter entitled The Dawn. It is the chapter in which he describes his conversion. He tells how, at a meeting held in a sailor loft at Port Chalmers in New Zealand, he was profoundly impressed. After the service, a Christian worker, whom I myself knew well, engaged him in conversation. He opened a New Testament and read these words, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The earnest little gentleman pointed out the insistence on faith. The phrase, believeth in me, occurs twice in the text. Faith and life go together. Would Frank Bullen experience that faith? Every word spoken by the little man went right to my heart, Mr. Bullen assures us. And when he ceased, there was an appeal in his eyes that was even more eloquent than his words. But beyond the words and the look, was the interpretation of them by some mysterious agency beyond my comprehension. For in a moment the hidden mystery was made clear to me, and I said quietly, I see, sir, and I believe. Let us thank God, answered the little man, and together we knelt down by the bench. There was no extravagant joy, no glorious bursting into light and liberty, such as I have read about as happening on those occasions. It was the satisfaction of having found one's way after long groping in darkness and misery, the way that leads to peace. Now the question is, did those words, the words that came with such power to Frank Bullen in the New Zealand sail loft and to Sidney Carton in the Paris streets, have the same effect upon both? Did they lead both of them to penitence and faith and peace? I think they did. Let us return to Sidney Carton as the sun is rising on that memorable morning on which he sees the text everywhere. He leaves the streets in which he was wandering by moonlight and walks beside a stream, a trading boat with a sail of the softened color of a dead leaf, glided into his view, floated by him, and died away. As its silent track in the water disappeared, the prayer that had broken up out of his heart for a merciful consideration of all his poor blindness and heirs ended in the words, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, whosoever believeth in me, the insistent demand for faith, he that believeth in me, Sidney Carton believed and found peace, he that believeth in me, Frank Bullen believed and found peace. Paul has a classical passage in which he shows that those who have passed through the experiences such as these have themselves risen with Christ into newness of life. Risen with Christ, they have found the resurrection. Newness of life, they have found the life. In his Death in the Desert, Browning describes the attempts that were made to revive the sinking man. It seemed quite hopeless. The most that he would do was to smile a little bit, as a sleeper does. If any dear one call him, touch his face, and smiles and loves, but will not be disturbed. Then, all at once, the boy who had been assisting in these proceedings, moved by some swift inspiration, sprang from his knees and proclaimed the text, I am the resurrection and the life. As if by magic, consciousness revisited the prostrate form. The man opened his eyes, sat up, 
stared about him, and then began to speak. A wondrous virtue seemed to lurk into the majestic words that the boy recited. By that virtue Sidney Carton, Frank Bullen, and a host of others have passed from death into life everlasting. I began by saying that it is a great thing, a very great thing, to be able to save those you love by dying for them. I close by stating the companion truth. It is a great thing, a very great thing, to have been died for. On the last page of his book, Dickens tells us what Sidney Carton would have seen and said if, on the scaffold, it had been given him to read the future. I see, he would have exclaimed, I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous, and happy, in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom who bears my name. I see that I hold a sanctuary in all their hearts, and in the hearts of their descendants, generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed, and I know that each was not more honored and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. I see that I hold a sanctuary in all their hearts. It is a lovely phrase. It is a great thing, a very great thing, to have been died for. Wherefore let each man be at some pains to build in his heart a sanctuary to him who, for us men and for our salvation, laid down his life with a song. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of A Handful of Stars Texts That Have Moved Great Minds By Frank W. Borum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer Chapter 5. Ebenezer Erskine's Text It is a lovely Sunday afternoon in the early summer of the year 1690. The graceful and heatherly path that winds its way along the banks of the Tweed, from the stately ruins of Melrose to the crumbling gables of Dryburgh, is in its glory. The wooded track by the waterside is luxuriating in bright sunshine, glowing colors, and soft shadows. We are traversing one of the most charming and romantic districts that even Scotland can present. Here, every field has its battle, every rivulet its song. More than a century hence, this historic neighborhood is destined to furnish the home and fire the fancy of Sir Walter Scott. And here, beneath the vaulted aisle of Dryburgh's ancient abbey, he will find his last resting place. But that time is not yet. Even now, however, in 1690, the hoary cloister is only a battered and weather-beaten fragment. It is almost covered by the branches of the trees that, planted right against the walls, have spread their limbs like creepers over the mossy ruins, as though endeavoring to protect the venerable pile. And here, sitting on a huge slab that has fallen from the broken arch above, is a small boy of ten. His name is Ebenezer Erskine, he is the son of the minister of Chernside. Like his father, he was born here at Dryburgh, and today the two are revisiting the neighborhood round which so many memories cluster. This morning the father, the Reverend Henry Erskine, has been catechizing a group of children at the Kirk. He selected the questions from the shorter catechism that relate to the Ten Commandments, and the very first of the answers that his father then taught him has made a profound impression on Ebenezer's mind. The forty-third question runs, What is the preface to the Ten Commandments? The answer is, The preface to the Ten Commandments is in these words, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Other questions follow, and they, with their attendant answers, have been duly memorized, but they have failed to hold his thought. This one, however, refuses to be shaken off. He has quite involuntarily repeated it to himself a hundred times as he pushed his way through the heather to the mossy abbey. It sounds in his ears like a charm, a challenge, an insistent and imperative demand. I am the Lord. I am thy God. The Lord thy God. It is his first realization of the fact 
that he is not altogether his own. Eighteen years have passed. He is now the minister of the Portmoke Parish, but it is a poor business. I began my ministry, he says, without much zeal, callously and mechanically, being swallowed up in unbelief and in rebellion against God. He feels no enthusiasm for the Bible. Indeed, the New Testament positively wearies him. His sermons are long and formal. He learns them by heart and repeats them parrot fashion, taking care to look not in the face of his people, but at a certain nail in the opposite wall. Happily for himself and for the world, he has by this time married a wife to whom the truth is no stranger. For years poor Mrs. Erskine has wept in secret over her husband's unregenerate heart and unspiritual ministry. But now a terrible sickness lays her low. Her brain is fevered. She raves in her delirium. Her words are wild and passionate. Yet they are words that smite her husband's conscience and pierce his very soul. At last, so runs the diary, the Lord was pleased to calm her spirit and give her a sweet serenity of mind. This, I think, was the first time that ever I felt the Lord touching my heart in a sensible manner. Her distress and her deliverance were blessed to me. Some weeks after, she and I were sitting together in my study, and while we were conversing about the things of God, the Lord was pleased to rend the veil and to give me a glimmering view of salvation, which made my soul acquiesce in Christ as the new and living way to glory. The old text comes back to him. I am the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God. Once more it sounds like a claim, and this time he yields. He makes his vow in writing. I offer myself up, soul and body, unto God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I flee for shelter to the blood of Jesus. I will live to him. I will die to him. I take heaven and earth to witness that all I am and all I have are his. Thus, on August 26, 1708, Ebenezer Erskine makes his covenant. That night, he used to say, I got my head out of time into eternity. Ten more years have passed. It is now 1718. Ebenezer Erskine is 38. Filled with concern for the souls of his people at Portmoke, he preaches a sermon on the text that had played so great a part in bringing his own spirit out of bondage. I am the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God. As he preaches, the memory of his own experience rushes back upon him. His soul catches fire. He is one moment persuasive and the next peremptory. No sermon that he ever preached made a greater impression on his congregation and when it was printed, it proved to be the most effective and fruitful of all his publications. Five and thirty years have run their course. Mr. Erskine is now seventy-three. He has passed through the fires of persecution, and, in the days of tumult and unrest, has proven himself a leader whom the people have delighted at any cost to follow. But his physical frame is exhausted. An illness overtakes him which, continuing for over a year, at last proves fatal. His elders drop in from time to time to read and pray with him. Today one of them, the senior member of the little band, is moved in taking farewell of his dying minister to ask a question of him. After grasping the sick man's hand and moving towards the door, a sudden impulse seizes him and he returns to the bedside. You have often given us good advice, Mr. Erskine, he says, as to what we should do with our souls in life and in death. May I ask what you are now doing with your own? I am just doing with it, the old man replies, what I did forty years ago. I am resting it on that word. I am the Lord thy God. Now what was it, I wonder, that Ebenezer Erskine saw in that string of monosyllables as he sat on the fallen slab beside the ruined abbey in 1690, as he sat conversing with his convalescent wife in 1708, as he preached with such passion in 1718, and as he lay dying in 1753. What to him was the significance of that great sentence that, as the Catechism says, forms the preface to the Ten Commandments? Ebenezer Erskine saw, underlying the words, two tremendous principles. They convinced him that the sinner must always be greater than the circumference, and they convinced him that the positive must always be greater than the negative. The center must always be greater than the circumference, 
where without the center there can be no circumference. And there, in the very first word of the preface of the Ten Commandments, stands the august center which all the mandates revolve. I am the Lord thy God. I have many times essayed, Luther tells us in his table talk, thoroughly to investigate the Ten Commandments. But at the very outset, I am the Lord thy God, I stuck fast. That single word I put me into a nonplus. I am not surprised. The man who would enter this palace of ten chambers will find God awaiting him on the threshold, and he must make up his mind as to his relationship with him before he can pass on to investigate the interior of the edifice. In learning his shorter catechism that Sunday morning at Dryburg, Ebenezer Erskine, then a boy of ten, had come face to face with God, and he felt that he dare not proceed to the circumference until his heart was in harmony with the center. He felt, too, that the positive must precede the negative. The person of the Most High must come before the precepts of the Most High. The thou shalts must come before the thou shalt nots. The superstructure of a personal religion cannot be reared on a foundation of negatives. Life can only be constructed positively. The soul cannot flourish on a principle of subtraction. It can only prosper on a principle of addition. It is at this point that we perpetrate one of our commonest blunders. Between Christmas Day and New Year's Day, we invariably frame a variety of good resolutions. We register a number of excellent resolves, but for the most part, they come to nothing. And they come to nothing because they are so largely negative. I will never again do such and such a thing. I will never again behave in such and such a way, and so on. We have failed to discover the truth that gripped the soul of Ebenezer Erskine that day at Dryburgh. He saw, as he repeated to himself his catechism, that the Ten Commandments consist of three parts. 1. The preface, I am the Lord thy God. 2. The precepts, thou shalt. 3. The prohibitions, thou shalt not. Our New Year's resolutions assume that we should put third things first. We are wrong. Ebenezer Erskine saw we must put the person before the precepts and the precepts before the prohibitions. The center must come before the circumference, the positive before the negative. When, at the end of December, we pledge ourselves so desperately to do certain things no more, we entirely forget that our worst offenses do not consist in outraging the thou shalt nots. Our worst offenses consist in violating the thou shalts. The revolt of the soul against the divine prohibitions is as nothing compared to the revolt of the soul against the divine precepts. Just as the revolt of the soul against the divine precepts is as nothing compared to the revolt of the soul against the divine person. It is by a flash of real spiritual insight that, in the general confession in the Church of England prayer book, the clause, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, precedes the clause and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. In his Ecce Homo, Sir John Seeley has pointed out the radical difference between the villains of the parables and the villains that figure in all our literature. In the typical novel, the villain is a man who does what he ought not to do. In the tales that Jesus told, the villain is a man who leaves undone what he ought to have done. The sinner whom Christ denounces, says Sir John, is he who has done nothing, the priest and the Levite who pass by on the other side, the rich man who allowed the beggar to lie unhelped at his gate, the servant who hid in a napkin the talent entrusted to him, the unprofitable hireling who did only what it was his duty to do. Christ's villains are the men who sin against the person and the precepts of the Most High. He scarcely notices the men who violate the prohibitions. Yet it is of the prohibitions that, when New Year's comes, we think so much. At Vesper Tide, one virtuous and pure in heart did pray, Since none I wronged in deed or word to-day, From whom shall I crave pardon, Master say? A voice replied, From the sad child whose joy thou hast not planned, The goaded beast whose friend thou didst not stand, the rose that died for water from thy hand. During a ministry of nearly thirty years, it has been my privilege and duty to deal with men and women of all kinds and conditions. 
I have attended hundreds of deathbeds. In reviewing those experiences today, I cannot remember a single case of a man who found it difficult to believe that God could forgive those things that he ought not to have done and had done. And I cannot recall a single case of a man who found it easy to believe that God could forgive those things that he ought to have done but had left undone. It is our sin against the divine precepts that sting most venomously at the last. The sad, sad child whose joy thou hast not planned. The goaded beast whose friend thou didst not stand. The rose that died for water from thy hand. Ebenezer Erskine saw that day at Bryburg that he must recognize the inspired order. He must bow first of all to the authority of the divine person. He must recognize the obligations involved in the divine precepts. And, after this, he must eschew those things that are forbidden by the divine prohibitions. That order he never forgot. George MacDonald tells us how, when the Marquis of Lossie was dying, he sent post-haste for Mr. Graham, a devouted schoolmaster. Mr. Graham knew his man and went cautiously to work. "'Are you satisfied with yourself, my lord?' "'No, by God. Would you like to be better?' "'Yes, but how is a poor devil to get out of this infernal scrape?' "'Keep the commandments.' "'That's it, of course, but there's no time.' If there were but time to draw another breath, there would be time to begin. How am I to begin? Which am I to begin with? There is one commandment which includes all the rest. Which is that? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What did the schoolmaster mean? He meant that the person must precede the precepts, and the precepts must precede the prohibitions. He was insisting on the divine order, that was all. And I feel confident that that was the burden of that powerful sermon that Ebenezer Erskine preached to his people at Port Moak in 1718. His last illness, as I have said, continued for twelve months. It was in its early stages that the old elder asked his question and received his minister's testimony concerning the text. A year later, Mr. Erskine referred to the words again. On the morning of the 1st of June, he awoke from a brief sleep, and seeing his daughter, Mrs. Fisher, sitting reading by his bedside, he asked her the name of the book. I am reading one of your sermons, Father. Which one? The one on, I am the Lord thy God. Ah, lass, he exclaimed, his face lighting up as a wave of sacred memory swept over him. That is the best sermon I ever preached. A few minutes later he closed his eyes, slipped his hand under his cheek, composed himself on his pillow, and ceased to breathe. The noble spirit of Ebenezer Erskine was with God. Ebenezer Erskine reminds me of his great predecessor, Samuel Rutherford. When Rutherford was staying for a while at the house of James Guthrie, the maid was surprised at hearing a voice in his room, she had supposed he was alone. Moved by curiosity, she crept to his door. She then discovered that Rutherford was in prayer. He walked up and down the room, exclaiming, O oh Lord, make me to believe in Thee. Then, after a pause, he moved to and fro again, crying, O oh Lord, make me to love Thee. And after a second rest, he rose again, praying, O oh Lord, Make me to keep all thy commandments. Rutherford, like Erskine a generation later, had grasped the spiritual significance of the divine order. Make me to believe in thee, the commandment that, as the schoolmaster told the Marquis, includes all the commandments. Make me to love thee, for love, as Jesus told the rich young ruler, is the fulfillment of the whole law. Make me to obey all thy commandments. The man who learns the Ten Commandments at the school of Samuel Rutherford or at the school of Ebenezer Erskine will see a shining path that runs from Mount Sinai right up to the cross and on through the gates of Pearl into the city of God. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of A Handful of Stars Text That Have Moved Great Minds By Frank W. Borum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer Chapter 6 Dr. Davidson's Text 
There are only two things worth mentioning in connection with Dr. Davidson, but they are both of them very beautiful. The one was his life, the other was his death. Ian McLaren tells us that the old doctor had spent practically all his days as minister at Drumtoshji. He was the father of all the folk in the Glen. He was consulted about everything. Three generations of young people had, in turn, confided to his sympathetic ear the story of their loves and hopes and fears. Rich and poor had alike found in him a guide in the day of perplexity and a comforter in the hour of sorrow. And now it is Christmas Day, the doctor's last Christmas, and a Sunday. The doctor had preached as usual in the kirk, had trudged through the snow to greet with seasonable wishes and gifts one or two people who might be feeling lonely or desolate. And now the day's work done was entertaining Drumshoe at the manse. All at once he began to speak of his ministry, lamenting that he had not done better for his people, and declaring that, if he were spared, he intended to preach more frequently about the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, Drumshoe, will have to go a long journey soon, and give an account of our lives in Drumtashti. Perhaps we have done our best as men can, and I think we have tried, but there are many things that we might have done otherwise, and some that we ought not to have done at all. It seems to me now the less we say in that day of the past, the better. We shall wish for mercy rather than justice. And here the doctor looked earnestly over his glasses at his elder. We would be none the worse, Drumshoe, for a friend to say a good word for both of us in the great court. I've thought that myself. It was an agony for Drumshoe to speak. I've thought that myself more than once. Well, and McCure was getting after the same thing the night he slipped away. And if any man could have stood on his own feet yonder, it was well him. It was the doctor's last conversation. When his old servant entered the room next morning, he found his master sitting silent and cold in his chair. We need a friend in the great court, said the doctor. I've thought that myself, replied Drumshoe. Well, and McCure was getting after the same thing the night he slipped away. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. My Bible contains two stories, one near its beginning and one near its end, which today I must lay side by side. The first is the story of a man who feels that he is suffering more than his share of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. He thinks of God as very high and very holy, too wise to err and too good to be unkind, yet he cannot shake from his mind the conviction that God has misunderstood him, and in his agony he cries out for one who can arbitrate between his tortured soul and the God who seems to be so angry with him. Oh, for one a little less divine than God, yet a little less human than himself, who can act as an adjudicator, an umpire, a mediator between them. But neither the heavens above nor the earth beneath can produce one capable of ending the painful controversy. There is no daysman who can come between us and lay his hand upon us both. A God, but no mediator. That is the first story. The second story, the story from the end of the Bible, is the story of an old minister whose life work is finished. He writes in a reminiscent vein to a young minister who is just beginning and earnestly refers to his own ordination. Whereunto, he asks, was I ordained a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity? What is his message? He answers his own question. It is this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. A God and a mediator. Job needed a friend in the great court, but alas, he could not find one. Paul tells Timothy that he was ordained for no other purpose than to point men to him who alone can intercede. One God, but no mediator, cries Job. One God and one mediator, exclaims Paul. In one respect, these two thinkers, standing with a long, long file of centuries between them, are in perfect agreement. They both feel that if there is a God, and only one, no man living can afford to drift into alienation from him. If there is no God, I can live as I list and do as I please. I am answerable to nobody. If there are many gods, I can offend one or two of them without involving myself in uttermost disaster and despair. 
but if there is one god and only one everything depends upon my relationship with him and if i am already estranged from him and if there be no mediator by whose good offices a reconciliation may be effected then i am of all men most miserable one god but no mediator cried job in despair one god and one mediator exclaims paul in delight one god and one mediator it is the glory of our humanity that it needs both one and the other we need a god and cannot be happy until we find him the instinct of adoration is in our blood and we are ill at ease until we can find one at whose feet we can lay the tribute of our devotion we need a mediator too and are at our best when we recognize and confess our need of him it is i say the glory of a man that he can yearn for these two things the most faithful and intelligent of the beasts feel no desire for either one or the other we know how dr davidson died i said that his conversation with drumshoe was his last i was mistaken his last conversation was with skye his dog when john the serving man paid his usual visit to the study before he went to bed the doctor did not hear him enter the room he was holding converse with skye who was seated on a chair looking very wise and deeply interested you're a bonny beast skye exclaimed the doctor for a thing he made is very good ye've been true and kind to your master skye and ye'll miss him if he leaves ye some day ye'll die also and they'll bury ye and i doubt that it'll be the end of ye skye ye never heard a god skye or the saviour for you're just a poor doggy but your master is the minister of drumtoshti and a sinner saved by grace those were his last words in the morning the doctor was still sitting in his big chair and sky was fondly licking a hand that would never again caress him sky the noblest dog in the world had no sense of sin and no sense of grace no need of a god and no need of a savior dr davidson sky's master is a sinner saved by grace and it is his sense of sin and his sense of grace his need of a god and his need of a savior that remove him by whole infinities from the faithful brute on the chair a sinner as our fathers used to sing a sinner is a sacred thing the holy ghost hath made him so when the soul feels after god and the heart cries out for a savior it is proof positive of the divinity that dwells within us one god but no mediator sighs job one god and one mediator cries paul none one the difference between none and one is the difference of millions none means nothing one means everything none means failure one means felicity none means despair one means delight none means perdition one means paradise the difference between no mediator and one mediator is a difference that can never be worked out by arithmetic one god and only one and one mediator only one but one is enough it is only in the small things of life that i long for a selection in the great things of life i only long for satisfaction when my appetite is sated and food is almost a matter of indifference to me i like to be invited to choose between this that and the other but when i am starving i do not hanker after a choice i do not want to choose put food before me and i am content if i am taking a stroll for the mere pleasure of walking i like to come to a place where several roads meet and to select the path that seems to be the most tempting but if weary and travel-worn i am struggling desperately homewards i do not want to have to choose my path i dread the place where many roads meet the place where i can go astray my felicity lies in simplicity i want but one road if that road leads home robinson crusoe climbs the hills of his island solitude and shades his eyes with his hands as he sweeps the watery horizon he is looking for a sail one ship will do he does not want a fleet there is but one way of salvation for my storm-tossed soul there is but one name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved there is one god and one mediator between god and men and one is ample the difference between no mediator and one mediator is a difference that has all eternity within it but it is time that we came to close quarters 
There are two people in every congregation with whom the minister finds it difficult to deal. There is the man upon whose conscience sin lies very heavily, and there is the man upon whose soul it sits very lightly. The first of these two perplexing individuals is afraid to approach the mediator. He feels it to be a kind of presumption. It is difficult to argue with him. It is better to introduce him to Robert Murray McSheen. McSheen had the same feeling. I am ashamed to go to Christ, he says. I feel when I have sinned that it would do no good to go. It seems to be making Christ a minister of sin to go straight from the swine trough to the best robe. But he came to see that there is no other way, and that all his plausible reasonings were but the folly of his own beclouded heart. The weight of my sin, he writes, should act like the weight of a clock. The heavier it is, the faster it makes it go. In the second of these difficult cases, the man upon whose conscience sin sits so lightly, I shall introduce to Dr. McClure. As Drumshoe told Dr. Davidson on that snowy Christmas night, if ever there was a man who could have stood on his own feet in the day of judgment, it was William McClure. Through all his long years in the Glen, the old doctor had simply lived for others. As long as he could cure his patients, he was content, and he was never happier than in handing the sick child back to its parents, or in restoring the wife to the husband who had despaired of her recovery. If ever there was a man who could have stood on his own feet in the day of judgment, it was William McClure. Yet, when the old doctor came to the end of his long journey, his soul was feeling after the same thing, a friend in the great court, an intercessor, a mediator between God and men. We have done our best, said the old minister, in that last talk with his elder. We have done our best, but the less we say about it, the better. We need a friend to say a good word for us in the great court. I've thought that myself, replied the agonizing elder. More than once. Well, and McCure was getting after the same thing the night he slipped away. And if any man could have stood on his own feet yonder, it was Wellum. And for minister and elder and doctor and me, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of A Handful of Stars Texts That Have Moved Great Minds by Frank W. Borum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer Chapter 7 Henry Martin's Text With Henry Martin, the making of history became a habit, a habit so inveterate that not even death itself could break him of it. He only lived to be thirty-two, but he made vast quantities of history in that meager handful of years. His, says Sir James Stephen, is one of the heroic names which adorns the annals of the English church from the days of Elizabeth to our own and Dr. George Smith, his biographer, boasts that Martin's life constitutes itself the priceless and perpetual heritage of all English-speaking Christendom. Whilst the native churches of India, Arabia, Persia, and Anatolia will cherish the thought of it through all time to come. Appropriately enough, Macaulay, who dedicated his brilliant powers to the great task of worthily recording the history that other men had made, composed the epitaph for that lonely eastern tomb. Here Martin lies, in manhood's early bloom, the Christian hero found a pagan tomb. Religion, sorrowing over her favorite son, points to the glorious trophies which he won, eternal trophies, not with slaughter red, not stained with tears by hopeless captives shed, but trophies of the cross, for that dear name, through every form of danger, death, and shame, onward he journeyed to a happier shore, where danger, death, and shame are known no more. For more than a hundred years the bones of Henry Martin have reposed in that far-off oriental sepulchre, but, as though he had never heard of his own decease, he goes on making history still. Henry Martin died seven years before George Eliot was born, and they had very little in common, but, in the novel which Mr. Marcus Dawes describes as one of the greatest religious books ever written, George Eliot makes the spiritual crisis in the experience of her storm-beaten and distracted heroine 
to turn on the perusal of the life of Henry Martin. When Janet Dempster, clad only in her thin nightgown, was driven at dead of night from her husband's home, she took refuge with the good old Mrs. Pettifer, and fell into a stupor of utter misery and black despair. Nothing seemed to arouse her. It chanced, however, that Mrs. Pettifer was a subscriber of the Pettifer Lending Library. From that village treasure trove, she had borrowed the biography that was lying on the table, when, like a hunted deer, poor Janet took shelter in her home. After a day or two, Janet picked up the book, dipped into it, and at length became so arrested by that pathetic missionary story that she could not leave it alone. It broke the spell of her stupor, gave her a new hold on life, awoke her dormant energy, and moved her to renewed action. I must go, she said. I feel I must be doing something for someone. I must not be a mere useless log any longer. I've been reading about that wonderful Henry Martin wearing himself out for other people, and I sit thinking of nothing but myself. I must go. Goodbye. And like a frightened dove that having been driven to shelter by a hawk, recovers from its terror and again takes wing, off she went. Janet Dempster is all the more real because she is unreal. She is all the more a substance because she is only a shadow. She is all the more symbolic and typical because she appears not in history but in fiction. If I had found her in the realm of biography, I might have regarded her as an isolated and exceptional case. But since I have found her in the realm of romance, I can only regard her as her creator intended me to regard her as a great representative character. She represents all those thousands of people upon whom the heroic record of Henry Martin's brief career has acted as a stimulant and a tonic. She represents all those thousands of people through whom Henry Martin is making history. The Gospels tell of a certain man who was born of four to the feet of Jesus. I know his name, and I know the names of the four who brought him. The man's name was Henry Martin and the quartet consisted of a father, a sister, an author, and a minister. Each had a hand in the gracious work, and each in a different way. The father did his part accidentally, indirectly, unconsciously. The sister did her part designedly, deliberately, and of set purpose. The author and the minister did their parts in the ordinary pursuit of their vocations, but the author did his part impersonally and indirectly while the minister did his part personally and face to face. The author's shaft was from a bow drawn at a venture. The minister's was carefully aimed. He set himself to win the young student in his congregation, and he lived to rejoice unfeignedly in his success. Let me introduce each of the four. The father bore his corner. Before Henry Martin left England, he was one of the most brilliant students in the country senior wrangler of his university, and a proud holder of scholarships and fellowships. But in his earlier days he failed at one or two examinations, and in his mortification heaped the blame upon his father. In one of these fits of passion he bounced out of the elder man's presence, never to enter it again. Before he could return and express contrition, the father suddenly died. Henry's remorse was pitiful to see. His heart was filled with grief, and his eyes swollen with tears. But that torrent of tears so cleansed his eyes that he was able to see, as he had never seen before, into the abysmal depths of his own heart. He was astonished at the baseness and depravity he found there. Years afterwards he writes with emotion of the distressing discovery that he then made. I do not remember a time, he says, in which the wickedness of my heart rose to a greater height than it did then. The consummate selfishness and exquisite instability of my mind were displayed in rage, malice, and envy, in pride, vainglory, and contempt for all about me, and in the harsh language which I used to my sister and even to my father. Oh, what an example of patience and mildness was he! I love to think of his excellent qualities. 
and it is the anguish of my heart that I could ever have been base enough and wicked enough to have pained him. O oh my God, why is not my heart doubly agonized at the remembrance of all my great transgressions? So poor John Martin, lying silently in his grave, entered into that felicity which, in one of her short poems, Miss Susan Best so touchingly depicted. When I was laid in my coffin, she makes a dead man say, when I was laid in my coffin, quite done with time and its fears, my son came and stood beside me. He had not been home for years, and right on my face came dripping the scald of his salty tears, and I was glad to know his breast had turned at last to the old home nest, that I said to myself in an underbreath, This is the recompense of death. The sister bore her corner. In his letters to her he opened all his heart. He is sometimes angry with her because, when he expected her to show delight in his academic triumphs, she only exhibits an earnest solicitude for his spiritual well-being. But in his better moments he forgave her. What a blessing it is for me, he writes to her in his twentieth year. What a blessing it is for me that I have such a sister as you who have been so instrumental in keeping me in the right way. And later on he delights her by telling her that he has been attending more diligently to the words of the Savior and to devour them with delight. The author bore his corner. It was just about a hundred years after the birth of Philip Doddridge and just about fifty years after his death that his book, The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul, fell into the hands of Henry Martin. Twenty years earlier it had opened the eyes of William Wilberforce and led him to repentance. Doddridge's powerful sentences fell upon the proud soul of Henry Martin like the lashes of a scourge. He resented them. He writhed under their condemnation. But they revealed to him the desperate need of his heart, and he could not shake from him the alarm which they excited. The minister bore his corner. No preacher in England was better fitted to appeal to the mind of Martin at this critical stage of his career than was the Reverend Charles Simeon, the vicar of Trinity Church, Cambridge. In his concern, the young collegian found himself strangely attracted to the services at Trinity, and he gradually acquired, as he confessed to his sister, more knowledge of divine things. He made the acquaintance and won the friendship of Mr. Simeon, and confided in him without reserve. I now experienced, he says, a real pleasure in religion, being more deeply convinced of sin than before, more earnest in fleeing to Jesus for refuge, and more desirous for a renewal of my nature. The prophet was mutual. For many years after Henry Martin's departure and death, Mr. Simeon kept in his study a portrait of the young student, and he used to say, that he could never look at that face, but it seemed to say to him, Be earnest, be earnest. And so, to repeat the language of the gospel, there came to Jesus one that was born of four, and his name was Henry Martin. I cannot discover that up to this point any one text had played a conspicuous part in precipitating the crisis which transfigured his life. But after this, I find one sentence repeatedly on his lips. During a journey, a man is often too engrossed with the perplexities of the immediate present to be able to review the path as a whole. But when he looks back, he surveys the entire landscape in grateful retrospect and is astonished at the multiplicity and variety of the perils that he has escaped. Henry Martin had some such feeling. When, at the age of 22, he entered the ministry. He was amazed at the greatness of the grace that had made such hallowed privileges and sacred duties possible to him. Even in his first sermon, we are told, he preached with a fervorous spirit and an earnestness of manner that deeply impressed the congregation. He preached as one who ne'er should preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. For, he wrote, I am but a brand plucked from the burning. Again, when the needs of the world pressed like an intolerable burden upon his spirit, the same thought decided his course. On the one hand, 
he saw a world lying in darkness and crying for a light. On the other hand, he saw all those sweet and sacred ties that bound him to his native land, his devoted people, his admiring friends, and, hardest tie of all to break, the lady whom he had fondly hoped to make his bride. Here on the one hand stood comfort, popularity, 